Bullshit. Let's pretend for a moment we've entered a parallel universe, free of bullshit and full of bold solutions. That's what No Bullshit Marketing is all about. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. Let's cut the bullshit. No one sets out to be a bullshit marketer, yet it happens a lot. Even with all those death of TV stories that go something like this. Old media, like Hollywood, cable TV, and broadcast networks, will continue to lose the battle for viewers to new digital media like YouTube and Netflix. But I want to talk about the difference between the TV and TV. One is a medium and the other is a vehicle to watch that medium. TV as a media outlet is not dying. We want more video when and where we want it. We still want to watch certain programs live, most notably sports, but the TV is no longer the center of our viewing experience as we use multiple screens, smartphones, tablets, laptops, to consume our content. Our desire to do what we want, when we want, combined with our consumption of media on multiple devices led the market to change. Binge watching of shows on Netflix or HBO Go has become commonplace. The community experience of watching a show at the same time as friends, family, and coworkers has gone the way of reading the newspaper. The advertising industry frets over these big changes in the way they did when other new media threatened the status quo. In the old days, it was said TV would kill radio. Cable would beat broadcast TV. Satellite radio would crush terrestrial radio. Mobile viewing will mean the death of TV. Yet the more things change, one constant remains. Storytelling as the driver of communication. We know a good story when we see or hear one. We'll talk about it with friends, family, co-workers, even strangers. The story is still king, and creatively telling yours is your first priority. Finding the right medium to creatively distribute that story to your target markets is next. And TV as an option to do so is not dead. Are you hungry for more bold solutions for marketing? Then you'll enjoy our guest today, Chef Jacqueline Wardle. She recently competed in the television show Cutthroat Kitchen on the Food Network. Jacqueline worked as executive chef of Isabella on Grandview, an area that overlooks the city of Pittsburgh. She's a graduate of the Pittsburgh Art Institute's Culinary Arts Program. Jacqueline, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, your career path. Well, I grew up in Youngstown and a kind of large family. I had four brothers and sisters. I was second oldest of the five who were all homeschooled by my mother. And I was never the kid who was really good in school. But actually, I dropped out of school my junior year in high school to get take a kitchen job. And I, um, I only finished high school just to go to culinary school to pursue my cooking career. So um, I, eventually, I eventually got through high school and <laughs> ended up at the Art Institute of Pittsburgh for their culinary arts program. And while I was in school, I was still working places around Pittsburgh, like the Common Plea. I opened Marty's Market. Oh, help open Marty's Market. Um, landed the job at Isabella on Grandview as a sous chef. And then eventually that brought me to my current adventure, the Small Galley in the Strip District, where I'm hoping to open my own restaurant, Josephine's Toast. There's a lot of stuff to go back to <laughs> on that. So let's first start with the big family. So you're one of five kids, and your mom homeschooled you guys? Yeah, I was homeschooled all, all through t all, 12, all 12 grades. And you, you actually quit school when your mom was the teacher? Yeah, well, you know, we had a disagreement. I, I needed to cook, and she didn't understand how important that was. I needed to get my foot in the door, because all the great chefs started cooking when they were, they were 14, 15 years old. So I, need, I knew that I needed to start cooking, and I needed to start cooking fast. So I didn't quit like, oh, mom, I quit. But I just started like, to st I started to stop doing what she asked me until eventually I just completely stopped doing my work. And then she just kind of gave up on me because I was, I was, um, well, I'm a teenager. So I was going to get my way regardless. And um, she let it happen. And I think I was better for it because the hard work is it's always going to be there so the hard work was in the kitchen and the hard work was in the schoolroom. so i needed to not only be a hard worker in the kitchen but be able to, to back it up with the schooling so it, it kicked my ass to get my ass in shape to go to college 
I have to say, a teenager kind of knowing what they want is pretty impressive. So when did it hit you that you wanted to be a chef? Um, well, I was kind of bad in high school. So my mom kind of signed me up for this youth group at my church. And the youth group did dinners every Friday night with um, a priest. He was uh, had a culinary background. And um, I was serving to start. So I was front of the house and I was serving these dinners. And I just, the the rush of the kitchen and the way, the urgency and the importance of just how a kitchen runs and the ranking of a kitchen and how he, um, and how he just knew exactly what to do and had A, B, C, and D lined up to go out to make this beautiful dinner just really hit me. And that's where I just stopped being such a pain in the butt and just really dedicated myself to something that I knew. It, it was something that put a smile on someone's face. Like mm -hmm. food brings so much happiness and so much joy to people and I just wanted to be a part of that. So I did whatever I could to be that person to bring that smile to someone's face. Really interesting background. So I want to kind of segue into our standard couple of first questions about bullshit in the workplace. So tell me a little bit about oh, no. when you've seen bullshit and then, you know, I'm going to come back and ask you when you might've been a <laughs> BS or, and you kind of touched on that a little bit already, but just give me an example from in the past when you just had to say that's BS. Okay. Well, so I was executive chef for a while, but I've always been the kind of person who's, I'm going to come to work and I'm going to get my job done and I'm going to go home or I'm going to go out. But there's, in the restaurant industry, and anyone will tell you that, and then this, in the restaurant industry, there are people, they're like grown-up babies. So they're people who never really get out of like the college phase. So um, it's the cooks, it's the servers, it's the managers, whomever they may be. They, they just, they, they, they drink, they party, they smoke, they do whatever. And which is all, like, that's what restaurant people do. I understand. Like, I like to have a good time, too. But it's after that. It's, after, it's in the morning after. I'm sorry. The 2 o'clock in the afternoon shift when they roll up and they're just waking up. And then they expect me to take it easy on them because they just got out of bed when everyone else has already been there. So it's those people who I just want to call the bullshit out on. Like, if you can't drink and party and smoke and show up for work at your 2 o'clock shift with a, with a shower and a nice pair of shoes and a clean uniform, like, that's bullshit. I love it. So let me, let me touch on that a little bit because having worked in the media, it, I think it's similar to what you're referencing here. There's an adrenaline rush, isn't there? So at the end of the shift, it is kind of natural to have the high energy and go... Party yeah, I mean, especially because the restaurant industry is such like a team, it's a team based experience. So the, the kitchen does good and the servers do good and you feel like this camaraderie and you all just want to like get like you'll everyone you have a drink or whatever. And then sometimes one drink leads to two and then you end up at another bar and then but it's all it's all positive until someone doesn't show up for work and the other person is doing the opening work and this guy didn't show up. But we all party at the same time. So exactly. So let's move into the other side of that, though. When's a learning experience when maybe you were the BS employee or maybe BS student? <laughs> <laughs> well, BS student for sure. I can't apologize to my mom enough. She definitely at least she got me back on track. But I was I was not into learning. I am learning. I'm great with learning about food. It's just the algebra. and the, Yeah, it's not my thing. Yeah. But um, I'm not really a bullshit kind of person. I, and the reason being is because, say I don't like your food. Even if I want to tell you that I like your food, when I don't like your food, it always shows on my face. And this happened in Cutthroat Kitchen. This happens in my daily life. Like, if I don't like something, you're going to know it because it's on my face. Um, like, if people are having a hard time with like their, like a server's having a hard time with their table and they're just like, oh, I just hate this. This is awful. Like, I'm still going to expect you to do your job just because like there's certain times in the restaurant industry where it's just not, it's not ideal. You just have to deal with it. If your food's bad, fix it. You know, like I expect more. And I can attest already that we don't have the video for this, but yes, the facial expressions. <laughs> 
are strong. And in our pre-interview uh, discussion when we were chatting, I told you how Carter, my youngest son, had uh, watches all those shows with Darling, my wife, and I had told him that you were going to be on. He was all excited. And so I was watching the show, and he remembered everything about it. And as I was watching it, I told you, I said, you were a great person to be on the show. The producer had to like you because you were constantly giving the nonverbals and the quips. <laughs> So let's talk about that show, though. How, how did it all happen? How did you get on that? And then let's walk the whole way through it and, and maybe give maybe some of the listeners haven't actually watched it. So talk about how the show is built. Okay, so Cutthroat Kitchen is, um, a, well, it's Cutthroat for sure, but it's four chefs and they're battling to keep their cut of $100,000. Each of us get $25,000. $25, See, once again, thanks, Mom. Um, $25,000 and uh, what you do is there's three different rounds and you have to make a different food for each round and Alton Brown the host he auctions off um, either like helpful things if you were to give it away to somebody else something that would be an advantage to you or um, just like just pure torture just so you can buy to give other people like at one point I had bought a, an, artich an artichoke dip hat to give someone um, and they had to do all their shopping and put it in their hat so as the rounds go on you just get eliminated one by one whoever has the best dishes stays on and I ended up making it to the final round unsuccessfully of course but I'm gonna hopefully Food Network listen I want to come back well I will say <laughs> I, I didn't know the outcome and Carter and I were watching it and I thought you did fantastic uh, they they had you you had to cook in a wheelbarrow tell our audience about that how it happened and and then what how you worked through it all right so here's the deal so they brought out this wheelbarrow and I knew spinach and artichoke dip I'm sorry it's not very complicated it's just not so I was thinking I mean the only thing I had to do was mix some things in a bowl and season some things and cook some pita so I was just going to let them spend all their money on it because I'm young and I knew I could literally cook circles around them. So I was just going to, you know, just let, let them give it to me. So I first I started to bid, I think. And then I was like, wait, this is silly. I'm not going to do this. I could totally handle this. So I let them give it to me. And then I had too much fun with it. People think it was the worst thing ever. But I mean, I just I looked at it and I I think I asked a producer. I was like, can I balance that on my thighs? Like, can I just hoist it up because and it, it had one wheel missing or something or it had it, one yeah. only had one handle one handle that's it. and nothing and, and no had, had one stands. wheel missing what am i thinking <laughs> so it had one handle okay, yeah go ahead I'm sorry. one handle and then um the leg was missing so it yes. would fall every time okay. he set it down so i just decided to make it a you know my new workstation and i owned it and i think my mom's favorite part was when i started uh doing glute exercises on national television <laughs> So then you uh, then you moved on to the stromboling round. And I say stromboling because uh, one of the contestants, you guys, the other two, you and your other contestant had her, had to go and stromboli to try to knock some bowling pins down. But you had to make your stromboli on while the other contestant was holding the pizza paddles. Pizza pa yeah. yeah. So talk about that a little bit. That was um, That was nuts because I didn't trust that guy at all. Um, the best part they didn't put on the TV show is he was grating his cheese for his stromboli and he was like, just a few more. I just needed a few more pieces of cheese, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh yeah, you do. And I took his cheese and I whipped it behind my back. <laughs> I got rid of all of his cheese. But, um, at the end of the day, we had to work together. So I had to be kind of nice. Well, I, the, the, the one more thing I do want to touch on that I thought was, classic uh youngstown slash pittsburgh <laughs> was so you serve your stromboli oh, gosh. and you cut it and you had made it in this difficult way and the and i don't know all the chef guys but the simon majumdar what is his name simon majumdar okay so he comes out and he complains that you took away the sensation mm. of biting the cheese oh, and yeah. then you come back and tell tell everybody what you said because it was classic. What did I say? You come, <laughs> you come back and you go. They, they cut to you and you go, dude. <laughs> I had to make this on this pizza paddle, and this guy's <laughs> looks like this, and hers looks like that, and you're gonna complain to me, and you're gonna hate on me for cutting, cutting it for me. <laughs> so that that made me feel like, hey, she might be from Youngstown, but she's a Pittsburgher because you were, you were going at it. So what this show's all about is is marketing, communication, and leadership, and so. 
uh, you turn a positive, you turn that challenging situation into a positive experience. And um, what I've learned over the years about marketing is you have to really drill down and define that target market and then come out and do marketing intel to find out what they want so you can develop it or tweak it and give it to them when and where they want it at a price they're willing to pay. And then you tell them about it again and again. Well, most people think that marketing is just that, tell them about it again and again. So you've done some really cool stuff in a quick, fantastic career. Talk about marketing from your standpoint. When have you felt you had to market yourself and when did you have a, a, a success in marketing? Well, I think um, going back to, I'm not trying to accentuate it anymore, but the cool way I was selected to be on the show was because of everyone has their own personal market on their Instagram, their Facebook, their Twitter, right? So my Instagram is how they picked me to be on the show. So a producer from Food Network must have been scrolling through whatever page on Instagram, came across one of my duck plates, and she wrote on my picture, she commented on my picture, and she was like, hey, blah, 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 would you like to be a contestant on Cather Kitchen? And I was like, this is a scam. <laughs> That's not real. <laughs> but um, it ended up, I emailed her with like a fake email because, of course, I thought that I was going to be robbed. Um, and it ended up being real. And I think that was a really awesome way of marketing myself. Maybe I wasn't trying. To, well, we all are trying to market ourselves in a little bit, especially chefs. When we take pictures of our food, we make sure that this is right and this is right and the sauce isn't runny and this isn't broken. Everyone markets themselves in a different way. And I think my Instagram kind of show them that I was a fun personality and that I could cook. What I like about the approach is that you had to take that picture in a way that it's the one big idea where as soon as you see that picture, it sells someone on what you did. And then you have to put it out through different vehicles on social. And it really is about marketing for anyone in your space. You have to get that personal brand and you were able to. Now talk about after Cutthroat Kitchen, what all have you done to kind of leverage that, to showcase it, and to get people to know that you were on? That's the hard part. See, I'm really hard on myself, so because I didn't win, I had a hard time, like, talking about it or being proud of myself for it. But um, the coolest part for me is when other people notice that I was on that, and it gives them, I think it's because I was on TV that they feel more comfortable to come to my restaurant because, oh, well, she was on Food Network, so she can't be too bad. Mm -hmm. So I feel, I mean, I've gotten recognized in the grocery store, Penn Mac one time, a few times at a bar. So, I mean, that was a really cool experience because I am, I am my own, like I'm marketing myself. So to give myself that exposure, people recognize me and they might see me as a trustworthy, fun person to be around. I think that with reality TV, the winning isn't as significant. So I would encourage you to promote that as much as you can because I really mean it when I say you were uh, watchable on the show like on some reality shows you forget some of the people and you remember one or two and on your particular episode you were compelling and I think that that's all that matters that you were a on a national show and b you were compelling on that show so as a message guy I would tell you talk about that promote that uh, the three month anniversary six month anniversary one year anniversary <laughs> post it on your Twitter, put it on Instagram, put it on anything you can, because I think it is a good story. Well, thanks for the encouragement. I will try to muster the confidence to do that. <laughs> sure. Sure. Just remember, Carter thought you were great. Okay. And he knows his stuff. Well, I have to hang out with Carter now. Yeah. <laughs> so I talk a lot about uh, asking what's the big idea. And so when you and I were talking before the show, I said, when it comes to messaging, we have to understand both our why or reason for being and our customer's why or reason for buying. We then need to crystallize that into one big idea, one memorable message or theme that makes an emotional impact on our target audiences. So what's your big idea? I think um, right now in my life, the big idea for me would be my new restaurant concept. It's my restaurant. It's going to be called um, Josephine's Toast. And it's just a quirky play on a classic favorite. So my favorite snack since I was little was always toast. And I, I like it simple with butter and jam, but to be competitive in the restaurant, the booming restaurant um, Pittsburgh scene, it, it's going to be like my fine dining experience, my fine dining food mixed with my fun, quirky personality. And then I'm just going to present it on um, homemade bread. So it's going to be all delicious foods on toast. 
And I think that that's really going to be, it's going to be um, a younger crowd. And I think that it'll be easy to target the younger crowd, but I also don't want it to be limited to the younger crowd. I just, it's just honestly going to have to take an open-minded person. So I want to market towards the open-minded eater, if that makes any sense. It does. And I think that you're, you're going to have an opportunity if you can get that concept onto some of those shows. There was a show, and one of the shows, and there's so many of them, but one of them featured uh, PB&J restaurant in New York. And just that's all they serve was peanut butter jelly sandwiches different ways. Mm -hmm. Well, when my family was in New York, we went there. Mm -hmm. And like the five of us go strolling in. And it was about as big as this office, okay? Wow. But that's because they can't have any overhead. They're selling peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Right. But they were making them 20 different ways. And we went in and took all the pictures and everything like you do when you're on vacation. Act silly. But I think that's kind of sort of the angle that you're going to need to get there is to convince people that come try this because it's something completely different right. but still pretty tasty. Yeah. So what what do you think your signature thing that will be there? What's the – what will be the – Well – I love simple, straightforward food, and I know that this will probably never happen, but I would hope that the signature toast would be, you pick the bread, because we're going to have like five varieties of bread, gluten-free and dairy-free being one of them, um, and just picking a nut butter and a homemade jam, but that's just me being simple, and that's how that's what I like to eat. So that's kind of like if you were asked me what to get at my restaurant and you were needing a snack, that's what I would say. But my favorite thing for the winter that I'm doing right now is um, a red wine braised beef stew on a thick-cut brioche with camembert cheese. Ooh. So I think that'll be... Can we go there after the show? That? <laughs> Unfortunately, we're open until the middle of December. Okay. But okay. Soon. We'll be there for the grand opening. Good. All right. We'll be there. So now it's time to move into where you help our audience. Uh, pick a tool or tip that you'd offer to help them craft their story, tell, tell their story, what their big ideas, convey their message. It could be something as simple as how you go about doing the messaging for your restaurants, how you talk to your team, how you lead the team that you said there's the adrenaline rush, how do you lead them, how do you communicate. Or it could be something like your favorite blog or productivity resource that somebody else could benefit from that's tough because i've been given a lot of good advice um there's always people who are willing to help so they always want to give younger people advice and i appreciate that um i think what i would say to anyone who's trying to be a leader is um know what you know and know what you don't know because my restaurant may be centered around gourmet toast, but without bread, you would have no toast. So I have a really close friend of mine who's going to be doing all the baking. And the reason why my restaurant will be successful is because, say I'm the leader and I'm um, the owner of this restaurant, but without her amazing talent and her amazing um, bread and baked goods and just her overall... Um, just personality and um, just the quality of product that she's proud to produce, I would be nothing. So I would always say just I know the I know the culinary part of it and she knows the bread part of it. So I would never take credit for something that I didn't do or something like that. So just know what you know and then know where you need help. Don't be afraid to ask for questions or ask for help. That's excellent leadership advice and an excellent tip because one of the things that's the toughest is people will say to me, uh, I've been interviewed like this, and people say, what's you know, what's some of the things that you would attribute some of your success to? And I humbly say, like, oh, I don't know that I've had much success, but one thing I do pretty well is listen to advice. And I'm amazed at how few people are willing to listen to advice. Like, if I bring someone in to work on something, I'm going to listen to them. If Michelle says, I want to try this, I want to yeah. try Mike Gaddy, Suzanne, other people on our team. But even when I, I coach sports, and I, if I have a person coaching with me and they lean over and say, try this, I go, all right. Exactly. Because <laughs> so you'll never know unless you try. Yeah. And everyone comes from a different background, different experience. So they might have a, a special knowledge that you don't have. And you'd be silly not to listen. Exactly. Glad you were here. It was a good time. And to our audience, thanks for listening to the No Bullshit Marketing Podcast. Visit boldsolutionsnobs.com for show notes, plus additional marketing and messaging resources. Sign up for light reading. You'll receive valuable strategies every other week to improve your marketing and transform your messaging. 
It really is light, intended to be read in two minutes or less, and it just might trigger bright ideas for you. To sign up, visit MassSolutions.biz. That's B-I-Z. Remember, ask yourself, what's the big idea? And build your story around the answer. It's all about bold solutions 